Well, it was sort of, you know, I mean, part of it is sort of, I guess, a story of sort of New York, you know, and the this, uh, you know, kind of widening labyrinth of connections that one yeah. makes. Um, so it all, I think, started with, I used to play with the Gil Evans Orchestra at Sweet Basil, the club, on Monday oh, nights. Yeah. And through that, I met Randy Brecker and Gil Goldstein. And um, Gil... Uh, produced a record for Randy, a really nice record in 1995 that he hired me to play on, kind of a Brazilian, electric, Brazilian-influenced record. And I think that's how Mike heard me. Um, and then they had, my first time playing with Michael was I subbed for the guitarist Dean Brown with the Brecker Brothers. Oh, in- wow, well, okay. 1996, just for a couple of gigs at the Red Sea. How, how was that like? It was incredibly fun. Oh. Incredibly fun, yeah. Um, and then, uh, and Mike sort of generally talked about wanting to do some more playing, you know, which I was thrilled at the prospect. Um, and then we played, I started playing a bunch with John Patitucci yeah. around this time with his one of his quartets, he had a, these kind of straight ahead groups uh, playing the music from one of his records. And we got together with Mike uh, to play. I had never played like straight ahead jazz with Michael. And we played a jam session, I think, at John's house when John moved back to the New York area. Um, and so I guess sort of based on that, after Mike um released his record called time is of the essence with mm-hmm. Methane yeah. And oh, yeah. Yeah. the organ record yeah uh, mike called and asked me if i wanted to to play with him for the oh, tours oh. um supporting that record yeah to which i said yes of course <laughs> sure. and uh and so that began that sort of uh, you know on and off five or six year um working with mike so we did a lot of playing together um especially right after that record came out we did four or five pretty solid tours of europe and america and japan and yeah and then i played on his uh, was it his next record or oh, yeah. wide angles right yeah. Yeah, wide angles yeah. uh, and in between that we did a lot of work like I would. We did some things quintet with Joey Calderazzo, which was a blast, wow. and then we'd play sometimes guitar quartet, um, like that stuff from Mexico City, um, and then the wide angle stuff. And then we toured that group, and um, so I feel very fortunate to have done so much playing with Mike and hung yeah. out. With him. He was an incredible human being. Uh, how was he like as a band leader, like with his music towards you guys? Like, I mean, did you ever talk? Did you ever? Did he ever tell you like what to do or what's what is like really? Um, he was pretty hands off, but he he would say things once in a while that were really really great. You know, like a couple of things he said to me, I remember to this day, and he never ever came off like. I'm going to, you know, I mean, he was a very, very humble person. I think like a lot of great musicians, he would hire you as a, as a musician in his group because he liked what you brought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, But he, a couple times he would just say little things like maybe let's not play so long on that tune or, Uh you know, or he, he loved, loved the electric guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Loved rock guitar, obviously all the Brecker Brothers stuff, and and so he loved it when I would I would play, you know, mostly with a clean sound, but I had a pretty elaborate pedal board that I would use, you know, like wah wah or things. Yeah. He loved guitar effects, you know, and and you know would 
never say anything like do this here or you know very little yeah. specific but um and then a couple times he made some some comments you know that i that were profound and that i learned a great deal from you know yeah. that sort of topical in terms of what we were doing in a particular group but also sort of like these and i don't think he meant them like this these lesson things that I, I learned some very valuable lessons from. Like, do you remember some of the stuff like? There was once where we were playing quartet with Mike and every time when I would solo, I was deeply into it. And I think it was with Scott Colley and Clarence Penn. We were deeply into oh. this metrically modulated, you know, polyrhythmic shit that I'm obviously still into, but we were really exploring that at that point. So we would play behind Mike in the way that we thought sounded great behind Mike, you know, and then when I would start to play, I, I guess we would go into this bag pretty heavily, which was by definition incredibly varied, right? Yeah. I, mean, I don't mean that that was necessarily a good thing, but it was like never the same. It would be this and that yeah. and the other. And Mike said something that I, I think was a was very instructive. He said, you know, what you guys are doing is fantastic. I don't even understand what you're doing. But he said, you know, the one thing I would say is that you have to be careful because there's a sameness to that approach that even though it's anything but the same thing every time you play it as an overall tone, you know, somebody who can't identify that you know there's five sixteenths here and seven over there yeah, yeah. there's a tonal thing that will come across as being similar and i went oh, that's really interesting and i when i thought about it i realized that i really agreed with him and that i've seen this in in groups and people presenting their music very very complex music you know if you took you analyze one tune compare it to the next it's completely different but yeah. at sound, fucking shit all starts to sound the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? It's like Makes sense. Yeah. if everything is angular and metrically modulated, it doesn't matter that it's all one thing is 74 over yeah. 20 and the yeah. other one is that. It sounds the same as a big picture sound. And I yeah. think that that was a very important lesson for me and yeah. one to you know, it's not like I'm I'm saying this from the vantage point of, well, I want audiences to be. I don't really care about. No, no, no. But yeah. But for me, as a listener, you know, and at the same time, there's there's stuff like if I go to hear a particular historical figure's music or somebody, I'm going to hear maybe a certain kind of approach. You know. Yeah. If I go to listen to Webern, I don't expect. You know, Beethoven, um, yeah, yeah, sure. it's yeah. going to be Weber, but Weber and his Weber, and I'm not. Um, but I, that to me was a very, was an important thing to have this sort of, and, and it's something that when I think about Miles Davis at his best, I think he sounds like a somebody who, like those solos on live records, like he went back and overdubbed about 15 times to come up with that thing that he played live. So <laughs> the ability to sort of, be an objective producer of what you're doing to hear what you're doing in a way from having to a distance to yourself. Yeah. yeah, is something that I aspire to. I'm not saying I'll ever achieve it, but that thing of, of being able to hear, OK, you know, like maybe I did. I used that approach on the last solo. Let me try a different approach. Yeah, this one. Yeah, like, I'm capable of it. I've practiced enough. Yeah, no, don't do that. And that to me is something, you know, I, I don't like, you know, if anybody, especially students ever says, well, what are you thinking about when you're playing? Like, I'm not really thinking about anything. I'm just trying to play. Sometimes in terms of an approach, I'll s tell myself something, even quietly, like, you know, try this direction on this improvisation. 